heard this song. Yes, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a favorite of many kids and grown kids. How about this one? Both of these songs were written by Al Smith, better known as Mr. Singspiration, and that will be explained a little later. So I just thought it would be fitting to share the life of Al Smith. He's one of those people that has left a big imprint on my life in a positive way, and he just enriched my music heritage because I grew up hearing all of his songs. One of Al's sons david smith has graciously accepted an invitation to share more about his father with you before we have david smith come and share more i wanted to share a memory i have a personal memory uh, back in 1987 i accompanied al smith to sing in what was our home church at the time in charleston south carolina after the service, Al Smith presented me with this book called Some of the Best. I opened it up later. I saw a note that Al had written in it. It says, Dear Jennifer, thank you so much for your wonderful accompaniments. Sing Searly, Alfred B. Smith. And to me, that just meant a lot to me because I had looked up to him all those years already for his good music. So, just looking at him when he was singing, I remember that it's, it seemed like he was just talking instead of singing because he made it just sound so natural. Uh, he was very sincere when he sang about his Lord and sharing how he felt about his Lord and it, it, it came out. It was just beautiful. Something else that enriched his singing of the hymns was he knew a lot of the composers firsthand or secondhand from like a close friend of the composer. Some of the composers he personally knew, him composers, Audrey Murr, she wrote, His Name is Wonderful. And then Austin C. Miles wrote In the Garden. And Pastor Ackley wrote, He Lives. Just by knowing these three authors and more, it enriched his singing. He, he could sing it with a more personal meaning. David Smith is the administrator and music pastor at Grace Baptist Church in Columbia, South Carolina. He is also a board member of Bible Broadcasting Network, better known as BBN. It's good to have David Smith with us. He is uh, Al Smith's son, one of his sons. Um, Al has two sons and two daughters, right? From the second marriage. Right, from the second yes. marriage. Yeah, and the first I, wife died, had two kids, so I have a half brother and a half sister, and then now there's four, yep. So in 1916, Al was born in New Jersey, and he was born to Christian parents. So his mom loved music, and she would sing hymns around the house. So Al learned those hymns, and when he was four and a half, they realized you know, this kid is really liking music. So they bought a phonograph, which came with records. They didn't realize was coming. The records were coming. So a couple of those records had classical violin players. So she would play that music for Al throughout the day. And so his interest in music increased. And by hearing the violin, he just, he loved hearing that violin. So when he was eight and a half, years old, what did Al's mom, what action did she take and what did that lead to? 
Uh, well, there was a great interest for my grandmother, for my dad to play the violin, and there was a great interest for my dad to play the violin as well. So they started taking lessons. And uh, so they, uh, uh, he, he got to it and she made sure he did it. So uh, she was the enforcer to make sure that he practiced. And, but he took off and did very, very, very well. And even started uh, playing in special concerts and different places. And even as a young man, um, just in his early um, teenage years, soloed with the New York Philharmonic and uh, also traveled a fair bit as well, uh, playing in concerts as a young prodigy. And then at age four, or four not four, but when he was 14, uh, I guess a friend invited him to a tent meeting yeah, he actually went to the Hawthorne Gospel Church, which is in Hawthorne, New Jersey, he was having a tent meeting. Um, he went there, rode actually in the back, in the kind of the jump seat of the old car, that the car that would have the seat that popped up in the back. And he sat in the back there with his cousin. And they went to that meeting, and and uh, the Lord used that to, uh, he, he, he got saved at that meeting, and he also saw um, how God could use him. He really had a desire to be involved in he had been playing all this classical music now he wanted to play music to honor god so he saw that and experienced that it was a change a turning point in his life yes and when he played for the old-fashioned bible hour old-fashioned gospel hour yeah well did he what did he play the violin sing or played the, played the violin yeah just played violin back then in the early days yeah of course, anybody who played violin and stuff, they would be singing as well. You know, maybe if it was congregational type singing and stuff. But as far as any any solo work or anything like that, didn't happen until really his his uh, Moody days and Wheaton days. So. Well, then, who did he meet at that radio broadcasting place? His time there. Who did he meet? That he became friends with, and how did they affect his life from that point? Well, I would say there were probably many that did it, but Harold Bronlin, who was the pastor, I knew I'd remember that name. Really encouraged my dad to to hone his uh, gift that God had given him. And then also Larry McGill, who was actually the founder of the Pocket Testament League, who was my dad's friend since like second or third grade, really encouraged my dad to get involved as well. And um, during that time, especially when he was 15, 16, 17, uh, dad had really progressed far in this, um, in violin. And I believe it was when he was about 14 or 15, he was invited to go to a, um, Camp, or to a concert over in Pittsburgh. And so he and his agent got in the car. And of course, you can think of back then, how long it would take back in the 30s, how long it would take for you to go. Uh, maybe it was like around 1930, I think it was about 1929, 1930, but to drive from northern New Jersey to Pittsburgh. Well, when they got there, they found out they had gotten there a week early. Oh, wow. So in order to, and it took several days to get there. So there was no way they could drive back home and then come back. But the, his agent had heard that Percy Crawford had just opened a camp at Pinebrook and that they could go there for $9 for the whole week. Nice. <laughs> so they went there. And during that week, God really worked on my dad's life and God's a, a dad surrendered to do whatever God would have him to do in that. It was also during that same week that Jack Wurtson's wife got saved at Pinebrook. She called Jack up in New York and said, Jack, I got saved. Jack said, I'm so glad I've been saved for six months and I've been afraid to tell you. So it was Marge Wurtson got saved at that, sa that same week. Dad was at Pinebrook and God used, you know, of course, Jack Wurtson, amazing with word life. But that's the week, that week at Pinebrook, that uh, a parent one, one week early thought, oh, that mistake was actually a divine appointment for dad to be at Pinebrook with Percy Crawford that week. And God used that to direct him into ministry. When he, he went to college, right? Moody Bible Institute. Yeah, went to Moody Bible Institute first, correct. Was there anyone at the radio broadcasting network place that encouraged him to go to college? Was there? Uh, there were several people along the way. He was um, Dr. McPherson at uh, um, Church of the Open Door in, Pitts in Philadelphia, really encouraged dad to go to Moody. And then also... Um, you know, dad didn't have the funds to go. They didn't have scholarships or things like that. But they basically said, hey, if you'll come, we'll give you a job while you're here at Moody, and that'll help pay for things. So my dad's first job at Moody, he cleaned the bathrooms, and he got 30 cents a week to clean the bathrooms. <laughs> so, But it was during that time, the, the, the different people that were there that God used in his life to direct him, and he started getting involved in the radio program and the, the radio broadcast and really became um, – 
very good at that while he was at Moody. And then after he graduated from Moody, he was invited to go to Wheaton, Wheaton College. And so when he was at Wheaton College, um, he began a, uh, a lifetime friendship with uh, a young evangelist, a young preacher. And that young preacher said, hey, Al, why don't you lead the singing for me and I'll do the preaching, you lead the singing. And they became best of friends and traveled together for many years. And his name was Billy Graham. And so from 19, I would say from probably 1941, 1940, 1941. And this is shortly after, of course, in 39, um, dad was encouraged. He had written some songs and he wanted to put together um, uh, uh, kind of a, a chorus book and no one wanted to publish it. No one wanted to print it. They said, there's no market for that. So he went to uh, one of the, the, the head guys at uh, Moody there and said, you know, God has really in, uh, impacted me and really directed me to do this course book. And he reached into the desk, the, the man that he went to talk to, walk, I, I think it was, um, I want to say it's Stebbings, but well, I, it'll, it'll come to me later again who that was, but uh, George Sweeting or one of those guys. And he, he reached in that desk and pulled out an envelope. And he said, Al, somebody gave me this envelope more than a year ago and they said I would know when to use it and so he said I've never looked at it and he handed it to my dad and my dad needed five hundred dollars to print um those ten thousand books that that very first inspiration book and he opened up that envelope and it had five hundred dollars in it wow. well it was right before Christmas right before Christmas what better advertisement than the young people of college he gave all the students books to take home and they were gone and within two weeks all 10,000 of those books were gone. So we printed another 10,000. They were gone. Well, then all of a sudden, people are coming knocking on the door and saying, hey, Al, we'll be glad to print your book for you. We'll publish your book. And dad was like, no. So that was the beginning of Singspiration, which, you know, took off and became really is, is, still has never been sur surpassed as far as Christian publishing and all that it did. And so dad used that. And then, of course, during those Wheaton years, dad and Billy traveled and Billy would do the preaching, dad would do the singing, uh, uh, song leading, and that was with Youth for Christ and all the different things that were going on, these different meetings and these different things happening. And Singspiration really started taking off and really started getting big. And so dad in 1949 went full-time into Singspiration, introduced Cliff Barrows to Billy, and the dad went full-time in Singspiration and, and parted ways with, with the uh, Billy Graham. And it was shortly after that when Billy Graham started the Billy Graham Evangelic Association. Before that, it was just Billy and my dad. It really didn't have a, an association involved with it. But um, that's what took place during those years at Wheaton and uh, the years after. They also, uh, it, almost all the preacher boys, anybody involved in ministry at Wheaton too would have, um, um, I don't know if you'd call it, it, it's a privilege, but it was also you had an obligation. You were, you were taking care of one of the little satellite churches. There were satellite churches all over the city and all around town. And so you would take turns preaching in those little, and so that was all part of ministry that dad was learning as well during that time. What, what year or how old was he when he wrote his, was it For God So Loved the World, his first song? Um, yeah, I would say that was probably his first. Um, I'm thinking it was, I'd have to look here. I think it was 39 is when he wrote that. So he was born in 16. So, so he would have been 20, 23, maybe. Okay. If my math is right. Okay. So I, I will back up to, it was 1942 when he married his first wife and they had two kids, uh, Barbara and Gordon. Yep. And then five years later, Catherine became ill with MS. And at the time, like you said, they, they weren't verse, uh, well versed on that type of illness. Yeah. So that had to be a really hard time. And then 13 years later, after her, diagnosis she passed away singspiration wasn't it originally in pennsylvania yeah it was in Mont. well it actually was started in wheaton illinois box a wheaton illinois is where it started because it started when he was a student actually he was a student at he was right at the end of moody and then right before wheaton college and then he was in wheaton college and they had box a in wheaton illinois but then he moved it to montrose um i don't know what year it was it was in the 50s he moved it to montrose and so the headquarters was there in, in Montrose, and that's when he invited uh, John W. Peterson to come be a music editor for him in the 50s. And, and then in, no, maybe 60, um, Dad sold half the company to Zondervan and then gave half the company to John W. Peterson. Oh. And then it moved from there, it moved to Michigan. Um, um, you know, Zondervan moved everything there. And then Dad just went full time on his own, and he started uh, just doing his own music. He was traveling pretty extensively at that time, had been for several years. 
in summertime, every Bible conference across the country he was at, you know, he'd spend a week at each Bible conference all over the country and then just was traveling. He was traveling, you know, he'd be in as many as, you know, 75 churches, 80 churches in the year. You know, he, it's, he just was just gone all the time. Of course, his wife had passed away and, and then um, he met my mom and uh, she actually was a secretary at his he had bought a dealership, a car dealership, because it was getting ready to maybe go under or something in Montrose, Pennsylvania. And everybody that worked at the dealership went to church with him. <laughs> and if he didn't see you in church, he called you in the office and said, how come you weren't in church? Or, you know, I heard you weren't in church, Sandy. Where were you? So uh, it was really big for him. You might make sure. But anyway, so that kind of was his hobby. My mom was hired as a receptionist. And then my dad's secretary ended up moving with her husband somewhere. I think he worked for IBM and they moved him to Texas or something. And so my mom became my dad's secretary and pretty soon there was love in the air. And so my dad went to my grandfather to be, of course, I was not even a thought of and said, he said, Bill, I have a problem. I either need to marry your daughter or fire her. And my, my grandpa said, well, I'll marry her. It's fine with us. So they, uh, they uh, got married and uh, about a year and a half later, my sister was born. And then a year, year and a half later, my twin sister and I were born, and then a couple of years later, my brother John was born. So I didn't realize you had a twin sister. Yep. So you know, I'm, I'm rewinding a little bit, but when you were talking about your dad really started traveling after he sold part of Singspiration. Well, he was traveling a lot in the '50s. Of course, traveling was a little bit different, you know, in the '50s. But you know, he was traveling. He pretty much started going on the road full time after he had separated from Billy. Um, really, in 1949, 50, he started traveling pretty extensively. And he was, of course, he was promoting Singspiration. He was also then just doing concerts and the hymn history concerts and all that, and just traveled all over the, really the world. That's when I, when I heard you say hymn history in the concert, uh, yeah. that was such a neat thing. He was so interested in the story behind the songs and the Lord just seemed to put him in the right places, being able yeah. to speak to the composers firsthand here in their story or a friend of the composer. Yeah, first and second hand, and a lot of first hand, especially born in 1916, being able to, uh, he knew several people, you know, he never knew Fanny Crosby, but I think he probably knew more about Fanny Crosby than anybody else. But um, yeah, really had opportunity to meet some neat people and to, to hear some great stories of the different songs written. And and then, of course, the book that's even on the, the keyboard right there with you, the yeah. M history book. This one, yes, I love this book, and it has at least 100, 115 hymn stories. I yeah, I have the first edition. You can see how worn it is. The I've worn off the back. I had to put a little tape there coming apart. Uh, but this is pretty special to me. My dad, when I went off to Word of Life to Bible to Bible school, dad wrote a little uh, something in there for me when I was headed off there. So this has been pretty special. So I use this one extensively. These are still available. They've been out of print. Well, we just ran out and they're they're being reprinted. They're supposed to ship uh, like the middle of February. So they're um, back in stock. Oh, mid of February, they're going to be back in stock. I believe, yes, I have mine signed. Uh, yes, 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 yes. I actually saw one on eBay for, they were selling for $900, an autographed one. <laughs> yeah, go to livinghymns.org. Livinghymns.org, you can purchase that. Uh, Ronald Reagan, we get, were able to visit the White House when I was a young kid. And Ronald Reagan, my dad gave Ronald Reagan a first edition. He said it's the best gift anybody ever gave him while he was president. Just absolutely love that. Uh, Al Smith's Treasure of Hymn Histories. Now, then in 1985, your family moved to Greenville? Yeah, 1985. Um, the, just the town we were living in was kind of dwindling away a little bit, I think. And Dad wanted a little bit more central location and a little warmer location mm -hmm. because he was still traveling very extensively at this time. And so we moved to Greenville. He went there. He had some friends that were tied with uh, Bob Jones University, but then also had some friends that lived in the area that wanted to help with uh, music and everything. So uh, we moved there in the summer of 85. Uh, we went to Bob Jones Academy and the university, and um, it was a big change coming from a little town of 1,400 people to Greenville. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and that's where we that's where Dad stayed until the Lord promoted him in uh, 2001. And uh, but stay and he stayed active and busy, traveling right up until just seven weeks before the Lord took him home. He was his last big thing to do was a big. Um, conference over in Tennessee had over 20,000 people at it. And he he uh, led the singing and and told stories from his wheelchair. At that time, he was pretty much confined to the wheelchair, um, just as his knees had pretty much given out. And so 
Uh, but the Lord used him right up till the end. I I was going to ask you what it was. What was it like living with a well-known father like you had? Yeah. Well, when you're a kid, you don't really realize it because you just travel. And so I got to rub shoulders with a lot of people and um, really who's who of Christianity in the 70s and 80s, really 90s. And um, so I didn't really, you know, I didn't know it was that big of a deal. Uh, I remember one time when I was just a little kid. We sang his banner over me as love and someone said that's so cool that your dad wrote that song and i said my dad didn't write that song i didn't realize that my dad had written that song <laughs> so me neither um, until a week ago <laughs> yeah yeah so um and then we did like jesus the rock of my salvation is better for me as love you know we we'd sing these things and people would say that and are surely goodness and mercy or for you know the different songs and i was you know as it's as i got older in my teenage years i started to realize you know what a what a neat treat and also, the, the opportunity we had to travel, we traveled a lot, not so much during the school year because we were in school, but during the summer times, we would travel a lot and we'd go to different conferences and campgrounds. And it was really neat to be able to travel and uh, really, you know, visit those places. And again, rub shoulders with some um, some pretty neat, pretty neat men of God that uh, really made an impact on the world. So it was very neat. Well, and shortly before your dad passed away. What was it he shared with your family that he would like to see? Well, he wanted um, everything that he had worked for to continue. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make sure that it continued as far as, you know, keep good music out there, keep, keep, keep the stories out there. And so my brother and I together started Al Smith Ministries kind of at his beck and to, to, to keep those things going. And, um, you know, I'm full time at a church, but I still travel a little bit. I could travel more, but I, I really like being in a local church. But um, to get out and do hymn history concerts, to do basically just um, give that fresh perspective of the hymns that we sing all the time, realizing that they didn't just happen because someone said, hey, you need to write a song. But God worked in someone's hearts, worked in someone's life through a tragedy, through a seeming tragedy. And through that, they were able to pen the words um, and the, maybe got someone to help them with a the melody or maybe God gave them both the the words and the melody. And And knowing how those songs came to be really brings them to life it really makes them a lot more special knowing why we have them and again they're testimonies of what god has done in the lives of people and the songs that are truly testimonies like that of how god's worked those are the songs that last yeah. you think of you know what a friend we have in jesus it is well with my soul um in the garden you think of um just many god leads us along yeah. all these songs that when you know the story behind them how they just, it's incredible to think about, you know, the love of God and how God was so involved in even the third stanza of that verse that was a poem that someone had written in Hebrew and then a prisoner in a jail had translated it into English and wrote it on the on the prison cell and somebody that came in to paint the prison cell thought that looked pretty good and he ought to write it down. He wrote it down before he painted over it and then pretty soon it ended up in a man's hand and it was perfect for the third verse of that song. You know, Brother Layman was like, he had written two verses and a chorus, but he didn't have a third verse. And back in those days, you had to have three verses and a chorus to have a song. So, but he found that little bookmark someone had, had given him and it fit perfectly. He didn't change a word. It fit perfectly with the melody that God had given him. And so some things like that, when you realize how God's involved in the music, you know, these days there's people that are under contract and they have to be writing new songs all the time. And yeah. of course they're going to get good ones every now and then, but when it's God working through you, when it's God that's, that's met a need and, and, and he's, he's helped you through the, the struggle, through the fire, through the, through the flood, through the, what's, whatever happened, the tragedy in your life, when he helped, when you get, go through those things and then he gives you those, those rivers of water flowing out. And that's where we get these wonderful songs. Yeah. That's why the devil doesn't want people singing hymns, by the way. <laughs> he just, he's happy with little uh, seven, seven words sung 11 times, you know, dad yeah. called them seven eleven choruses, you know, as your dad has said the second most important book is not the Bible, but the hymns. Yeah, but yeah number one is the Bible. Number two is the hymnal. Yeah. Good hymnal. Yeah. Number three is the hymn history book. <laughs> uh, that's a good one. Yeah. Very true. But I appreciate you coming and sharing your data. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for including me in this. I'm excited about it. And I will share dif the different resources available at uh, livinghymns.org so people are aware of the resources. Sounds good. Obviously, I guess you got your package. All right. Wonder, wonder of it all CD. You got your Wonder of it all CD. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, love, I love this CD.
it, it's very nice, very well done. I've got a second one that I've got to do. I've got five of the songs done. I just have to do five more. Okay. I, I would have had it done, but my pianist got sick. <laughs> I was going to say, I want, a, I want another CD, so that's good. You're yeah, yeah. Right. I'm working. Hopefully, to finish it up this spring. So. What's the name of the CD? The na I haven't named it yet, but I have five songs done. I'm going to do five more, maybe seven more. It either have 10 to 12 songs on it, and then, but I haven't named it yet, so. But that wonder of it all is that's uh, our platform here at Grace. That's our, that's the podium in the front of Grace. So, and you said the wonder of it all. That reminded me, I want to end this tribute with your dad's song. I've never lost the wonder of it all. So we'll be playing that, sharing that. Yeah, that's awesome. Good. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks for including me. It was fun. You're welcome. Bye bye. Take care. Have a great day. You too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Many many years ago. Um, D.L. Moody and Ira Sankey had an opportunity to go to England. And while they were holding those meetings in England, uh, it came, word came to uh, Ira Sankey that London Yard had made it impossible. They basically had outlawed any of the gypsies to come into England, to come into London, because uh, there were some that were expert pickpockets and they had created quite a, a stir with London Yard. And so they had just basically banned all of the gypsies from coming to town. Ira heard of that. He went to Moody and said, you know, Moody, uh, the, the gypsies, they need to hear about Jesus. He said, if I could get us a way out there, could we go out there? And Moody was like, yeah, see what you can do. So Ira was able to get a buggy, a horse and buggy. And so one Sunday afternoon, they headed out to the Epping Forest. They were greeted so warmly by the gypsy people there, the, the men and the women, and had a wonderful meeting with them and sang with them and preached. And when they got ready to leave, they got in the horse and buggy. And Sankey reached his hand out the window and put his head, hand on a little curly-headed boy, and he said, Lord, if this boy doesn't know you, may he come to know you and love you and make a preacher out of him. And with that, Moody gave the reins to the horses, and off they went, and back into London, and maybe never to be thought about. But some 50 years later, word came uh, to America of a great British evangelist that often would preach to 10,000 people, and the royal family would often be in attendance. And he was making his way to America for his very first meeting. And so he got there, and when he came into New York... He said, um, I know Ira Sankey lives near here somewhere. Could someone please get me to, to his house? And by this time, Ira Sankey had, was nearly blind, not completely blind, but very, very near blind. And um, he went and saw, went into the room and said, uh, Mr. Sankey, I don't know if you remember, but do you remember when you and Mr. Moody came to London and you guys came out to the, uh, the Epping Forest and preached to the gypsies? And Ira said, you know, a lot has happened between now and then. He said, but I remember that. He goes, well, I don't know. Do you remember putting your hand out the window and putting on a little boy's head and saying, Lord, may I come to know you. Lord, make a preacher out of him. He said, you know, a lot of things again have happened. He said, but I've never forgot that time. He said, Mr. Sankey, I never get into the pulpit to preach the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ that I don't feel the pressure of your hand on my head. It'd be many years later that Vance Havner was in the meeting that Gypsy Smith would come to America. It'd be the last time he'd be in America. And Gypsy just felt that he needed to go down there and, and show his thanks and shake his hand and say, thank you, brother, for being such a blessing all these years. And right before it was his turn to shake his hand, another man walked up to Gypsy Smith and said, Gypsy, I heard you preach 50 years ago. The first time you came to America, you preach with such power and such conviction. Tonight again, you have so blessed my heart, such power, such conviction. What's your secret? Without thinking about it for a moment, he said, I've never lost the wonder of it all. Vance Havner shared that story with my dad, and from that came, I think, one of my favorites. I've never lost the wonder of it all. You'll be able to understand a little bit better this evening. This morning I sang it in Spanglish. It wasn't really Spanish. It was close, but... Uh, Tonight it'll be in English, and hopefully you'll understand it better, and I can not cry while I sing it. <clears throat> Once so aimlessly I wandered round the tangled paths of sin. All about me seemed so hopeless, doubts and fears without within. Then a voice so kind and gentle spoke sweet peace unto my soul. Gone my days of sin and wandering, 
since the Savior made me whole. I have never lost the wonder of it all. I have never lost the wonder of it all. Since the day that Jesus saved me and a whole new life he gave me, I have never lost the wonder of it all. Now my life is full of gladness, all my days are filled with joy. I no longer walk in sadness, happy songs my lips employ. For I've learned the wondrous secret only those in Christ can know. Tis the peace of sins forgiven, joy that makes my glad heart glow. Would you sing it with me? I have never lost the wonder of it all. I have never lost the wonder of it all. Since the day that Jesus saved me and the whole new life he gave me, I have never lost the wonder of it all. Part two of this tribute to Al Smith will be a live Facebook event. I'll be playing at least a dozen of his songs. So please feel free to join in, sing along. And that will be February 1st, 2024 at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. See you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>